Secretary Pompeo, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us here at Rising Bharat. Uh, I just want to tell our audiences, he's flown in all the way from San Francisco. He's here just for our session here, and then he flies right back. So first of all, how does that feel? I'm hanging in so far. If I, uh, if I drop off, someone will come save me, I, I'm sure. I, I, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> so let me start off by asking you, our session today is titled Never Give an Inch. It's the title of your book. And uh, the thing that's of most interest to our viewers here, and you'd imagine that, uh, is what you said about what happened in February of 2019, when you were in office, when you were Secretary of State, uh, and you describe in your book why you felt that India and Pakistan were on the verge of a nuclear conflagration. Can you tell our audiences here and people watching home why you felt the way you did and what really pulled it back from the brink? Uh, sure. First of all, thank you for having me here. It's lovely to be at this uh, gathering. Uh, I, I know this place well. I ran a business here in India for uh, half a dozen years in the early 2000s. Um, so I have a special affinity for the people of India and the amazing economy that has been built here in the intervening 20 years as well. I've watched that uh, develop. You know, you all know the facts of that night in the same way that I do, that frankly, a couple of days, uh, conflict between India and Pakistan is always risky. Uh, you top that with and connect that to any time you have two nuclear-powered nations, nuclear-capable nations, and the risk of misunderstanding is very real, and bad things can happen very, very quickly. And so uh, Ambassador Bolton and I came to learn there was an aircraft that had crossed. We, we, uh, I, I won't go into the history, but we came to learn that the uh, national security apparatus in each country was very concerned about the other nation uh, beginning to take actions that would be consistent with use of a nuclear weapon system. Our task, the American task, was uh, to try and determine, A, what was real, what was just someone fearing what might happen. Uh, and so we began to deploy all the capabilities that we had, all the capabilities that our partners had to learn what each, what India believed they knew, what Pakistan believed that it knew, and then bring that data set all together. And that was really, in the end, you ask, well, how do you put it back in the box? Uh, that was the answer. It, we were able to, in, in relatively short order, uh, make pretty clear that neither nation was actually moving towards that, that there was lots of risk, that there were, uh, neither nation had a great deal of trust with each other, we had a pilot that had been uh, captured. And so there was lots of anxiety and risk along the conflict zone. Uh, but um, it became pretty clear, and we were able to effectively demonstrate that the risk that the other side was moving towards uh, using a, um, uh, a nuclear weapon was very, very low. And we were able to take that tension down over the course of just a handful of hours. But nonetheless, you know, there's, there's no issue when you're the Secretary of State for the United States of America. There is no issue that you worry about more than uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons and their potential use. And one of the things you worry about most is not that they will be used by someone who's doing so in a rational, intentional way, to find rational however one might like, but rather based on a set of facts that isn't real, that there's a mistake, a false release, some kind of storyline, some propaganda, some deep fake. You can imagine lots of things that would create a situation where it would get to a place you can't get it back. And we wanted to do everything we could that, that day and night to make sure that that moment didn't arise. And in this case, it, it did not. I just want to talk a little bit. By the way, last thing I'll say is really good professional leadership on all sides. Um, the team that worked for me, uh, the teams that were both in India and Pakistan did a very nice job that evening of managing a uh, very heated moment. What you know, what, when you were Secretary of State and in the Trump administration, the Pakistan policy was much more hardline than what we've seen in the last four years under the Biden administration. If you were, and now we all have the, the benefit of hindsight, if you were to assess uh, the changes that's been made in the Biden policy towards Pakistan, how would you assess it? Because there's been significant changes. The military deals have come back. Uh, some of the aid has come back. Uh, maybe not so much the importance, but but. It seems yeah. like Pakistan's not in the doghouse anymore. <laughs> Without adopting that analogy, uh, we, we, we came to believe that the policy that had been before us under President Obama, and frankly, under Republicans before that as well, uh, that engagement policy had not successfully delivered an outcome that was good for the United States. So we did. We, it took us a little bit, took us six or eight months, uh, but we reversed course with respect to Pakistan in material ways, providing lots of, lots of things that Pakistan wanted. 
not in an effort to punish, but rather in an effort to convince the Pakistanis that they needed to, to be part of uh, a model that looked more like ours than the Chinese Communist Party's model. And I think, unfortunately, and I don't mean this politically, I don't do politics on national security. I think, unfortunately, the last few years have demonstrated that we were right, that the policies that we had were more likely to reduce Chinese Communist Party influence in Pakistan and the risk of extremism in Pakistan uh, more than the policies that have been adopted these last couple of years. I still think, I think we largely had, I think we largely had it right. Um, I, I wouldn't say that about every element of our policy there, um, but we, we largely had it right. You compound that with uh, the failure of America in Afghanistan, and I think uh, American trust and leadership in this region has been diminished in these last three and a half years. Just to ask you a variant on, on that question, um, one of India's strategic goals of this administration, even administrations before that, is to uh, what we uh, call the de-hyphening the India-Pakistan relationship. That India is a rising power, it's now the world's fifth largest economy. In five or six years, it'll be the third largest. And therefore, India and Pakistan should not be clubbed together. Uh, which it may have been uh, if you go back 15 or 20 years. From your vantage point, you've held the Secretary of State position for four years and three years that has followed. Do you think India has succeeded in doing that? Uh, yes. So, you, yeah, yeah, it has. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I think it's succeeded. More, more needs to be done. Uh, but there's no doubt these, these two countries have taken fundamentally different directions, and I think you have economies to prove it. I think you can fundamentally see the difference in the growth trajectory of the two economies and, frankly, their place of leadership in the world. I, I think it is unambiguous that now you describe it declubbing the separation. I, I think it is unambiguous and clear. Um, I always root, just so you know, I, I root for every nation to be free and uh, have opportunity for their people. I wish no one ill will. That includes the Chinese com people of China. Uh, that's why I talk about the Chinese Communist Party, not about China. I'm rooting for their good luck and success as well. Um, but it takes government leadership models that aren't desirous of doing that on the backs of others. Uh, India has done this by building out its own nation in a fundamentally uh, creative, innovative way uh, and uh, I think has benefited and the world can see that as differentiated from Pakistan in the way you described. And India has obviously benefited from the China, what is described as the China plus model as you know, MNCs seek to uh, diversify their supply chains. You have now iPhones being in, made in substantial numbers in India, uh, and so on. Um, I'm asking you a hypothetical here, but if uh, President Trump were to return to power in uh, November this year, January 2025, um, what could India expect from a second Trump administration in terms of economic policy? I mean, there were friction points in the first Trump administration. Yes, you're, oh yes, uh, I yeah, remember yeah, them vividly. Yeah, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, there's always going to be trade friction between the United States and India. You, you write it down. Uh, it's both, it's natural that nations want to protect things that are theirs, including uh, we want to do the same thing. Uh, so that piece is untroubling. Uh, you know, I think, I think the best way, we, we are talking about something that uh, you know, may or may not happen, the best way to think about what a second Trump administration would be look like is to go back to the facts and data about the first one. By the time you get to be my age, Greg, I'm a, you know, things don't change. You're just kind of, your worldviews are pretty set. Uh, and so when I think about the, the work that we did alongside India in the national security space, in the economic space, uh, on the global stage as well, um, I suspect that the second Trump administration would adopt a set of policies that aren't dissimilar from that. Uh, that includes, uh, you, if, you, if you read a book by a fellow named Robert Lighthizer, talks about uh, tariffs and their economic benefit to the United States of America. I have a somewhat different view of that, um, but it is something that President Trump used in his first term, and I have every expectation he will continue to, to use that tool in the second term as well. Maybe different, it'll certainly be different for different countries, but the idea of developing a deepening bilateral trade relationship with India was something that was central to our effort. Uh, for our four years, I suspect if President Trump were to be reelected, that would continue to be the case. And will he have a second term? Oh goodness, you all see the same data I do. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't predict. It'll be very close. It'll be competitive. There'll be a half a dozen states where uh, where it will be will be material to the outcome. I'm hopelessly biased. 
Um, I think that the American people are radically better off uh, with a President Trump than they would be in a second term of President Biden. Uh, it probably doesn't surprise anybody that I think that. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful the American people will elect President Trump and we will begin to build uh, America's place, its leadership in the world in the same way we did, uh, and that the American economy will continue to accelerate in the way that it was before COVID was unleashed in 2000, in the beginning of 2020. Uh, well, well a, a Trump's second term may be viewed favorably here in, uh, uh, in India from New Delhi's point of view, but how may it be viewed in, from, from Beijing, from Riyadh, from Tel Aviv, uh, from Kiev, yeah. and of course from Moscow? Oh my goodness, uh, they gave me half a dozen. They'd be very different answers. Uh, where do you want me to start? No, w w w will the world be worried, especially given what we saw in the first four years of Trump, should the world be worried uh, how his presidency, if, if, if at all there is a second term, uh, his presidency yeah. may shape these relationships? Yeah. No, the world should be thrilled. I mean, how many wars started for those four years? Anybody got an idea? Zero. Yeah, zero. We now have a major conflagra conflagration in Europe, continuing now two years on. We have the most horrific act that I have seen in my adult lifetime. What, what Hamas did, what the Iranian leadership did to those women on October 7th in, in the southern part of the Negev desert is like unlike anything I've ever seen. And I've seen, as CI director, I've seen an awful lot. This, is, this, this didn't happen under President Trump's watch. Instead, we built peace and prosperity. We built what became called the Abraham Accords. We had four nations declare that they were no longer going to be hostile to the nation of Israel. We knew that Jerusalem was the rightful capital of Israel. Basic things that most of the people said, this will cause World War III. I, I remember, I was there. Mike, if you strike Qasem Soleimani, World War III will ensue. The, the truth is, just the opposite happened. We, we saw the entire world come to say, those people are serious. And they are going to defend the things that they promised to defend. Vladimir Putin didn't take an inch of Ukraine on our watch. He took a fifth of Ukraine under President Obama, and then he stopped. And then he went back at it again just a few months after we left. I know New York Times, CNN, International, they'll tell you it was just pure luck. Fair enough. Uh, maybe we did have good luck. Maybe the good Lord was with us. We can describe it, ascribe it to whatever we want, but I know it happened. We, Afghanistan didn't fall under President Trump. Right? These, these are things that we can factually present that are indisputable about the world being better off. So when you ask, should the world be worried about President Trump, I think the world will be fundamentally more prosperous and more secure were President Trump to be given a second term another four years. But, but how would, I mean, obviously the, the world he would inherit if he were to become president again is a very different world yeah. from when he demitted office. That's what I was just talking about. How yeah. would he, how would he, because the onus is going to be on how he's going to end these two wars. How would President Trump end the Russia-Ukraine war or the Israel-Hamas yeah. war? I, I, tr I don't do predictions. I, I just, I don't do predictions. I, I do factual, I do principle-based analysis of what's likely to take place and what happened, what I can prove happened. There, there are folks who say, gosh, this, you know, this, these things, I, 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 these are counterfactuals, right? Here's what, here's what I can say with certainty. Vladimir Putin had a fundamentally different perception of America when President Trump was in office. He just did. Uh, you can argue about why. Mean tweets. You just describe it however you, you choose to describe it. But the reality was that the missiles that saved Kyiv, the very Javelin missiles that were fired that saved Kyiv the night that they almost lost it, does anybody in this room know who provided those missiles to the Ukrainian people? Which president? It wasn't President Obama. He refused to do it. Had President Obama or his successor been elected in 2016, there would have been no Ukrainian defense that night from Javelin missiles. President Trump allowed those missiles to be delivered, saving Ukraine, giving them the very opportunity that they face today. I, I would tell you that in the Middle East, the Iranians understood that we were serious about defending things. We were serious about being partners with the Gulf states, the Emiratis, the Omanis, certainly the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Riyadh. Uh, we were serious about supporting these partners in a way that allowed them to move towards a different model in the Middle East. 
We want a good thing for the people that live in Judea and Samaria, that live in the West Bank. We wanted good things for them too. But we weren't about to let the terrorists that are under the thumbprint of Iran, whether it's Hezbollah or the Palestinian Authority or Hamas or the Houthis in Yemen, we weren't about to let them upset the opportunity for prosperity in the Middle East and for America, because it was about America first. We wanted to make sure our young men and women didn't have to go fight and risk their lives in those places as well, as they had done so many times over the last 25 years. I'm a former soldier. My mission set at the State Department was to deliver a model in the Middle East which no one ever asked for uh, the 82nd Airborne or Marine Brigade. And we had built that. And so I would suggest to you that were President Trump to get another chance, he would begin to rebuild that model. And this is how, in the end, these conflicts will end. The only way you convince evil, bad guys, to stop is power. You have to deter them. And the United States and the world, not just the United States, Europe, uh, Middle Eastern countries lost deterrence. And this is now what has to be returned. And I'm confident that it can be done. But regardless of what happens in November, will Ukraine be able to, st I mean, will Ukraine be able to stave off a possible Russian offensive in the summer, given the deadlock in the US Congress in terms of supply of weapons? They'll get what they need. Sorry? They'll get what they need. They'll, they'll, they'll get. So you mm -hmm. think it'll go through eventually? Uh, it, it will go through. The Ukrainians will get what they need. I, I'm convinced that they, that they will get the tools that they need. But I, I'll, I'll be honest, the, the fact that we've provided these weapon systems to them for now two years plus, we collectively, the Europeans, others as well, the Koreans, uh, many, many nations, not just the United States, uh, we haven't let them win. You have to win. You have to, you have, in the end, you have to convince your adversary that the cost of continuing conflict exceeds the benefit. It's that, it's, this is, this is deterrence 101. This is, this is economic 101. This is what you teach your children. When they behave badly, you have to convince them that their bad behavior, which they enjoyed and benefited from, their bad behavior is exceeded by the cost of that bad behavior. Uh, and that's what, that's what we lost. And I, we have to allow the Ukrainians to do that, and we didn't. I'm afraid we're not doing it in Israel either. Today, the President of the United States and many countries, the United Nations, I think India voted that way as well, is trying to constrain the one actor that has a chance of actually creating peace in the region. Right? The leaders of Hamas to this day, where they, tomorrow there will be a ceasefire, everything shuts down. What's Hamas going to do tomorrow? What would Iran do tomorrow? They'll go right back at it. This is no nation. India wouldn't allow this. In, in, India would not sit still for having their women raped and murdered at the level that happened that day. You'd go take care of whoever did it too. And by the way, the United States should support you in doing that. Uh, and if you had Indians held hostage, we should support your effort to go back and get those hostages. Today there are not only Israeli hostages, but American hostages being held by Iran. Uh, and rather than pay them billions of dollars, we ought to go win. And this is, this is the challenge. We, we didn't tell Israel, by the way, that they couldn't go into Gaza. Think about this. Think about the difference here. Israel is invaded by marauders, has hundreds of their people taken and held hostage, human shields being used to protect them. And we didn't tell Israel, no, you can't go, you can't go get them. We told the Ukrainians, you can't do that. We told the Ukrainians, you can't go hold anything Russian at risk. if you're sitting in Russian leadership, not just Putin, but Russian leadership more broadly, and your mothers put their children to bed peacefully every night in Moscow and St. Petersburg, versus the Ukrainian mother who puts her child to bed and prays that the missile won't come through the building that night, the, this is asymmetric. And this is the thing that will continue to drag this European conflict out. We have to hold something that matters to Russia at risk, or at least convince them that we will. I just wanted to, just to stay with Ukraine for a moment. So you don't subscribe to, um, you know, uh, sort of an intellectual theory of the, of the, of the present-day right in America, or parts of the present-day right, is that Ukraine is a distraction, and uh, actually the U.S. should, uh, you know, focus more on Taiwan and so on. You, you don't subscribe to that. And one strand of the theory is that the whole expansion of NATO eastwards was some kind of a provocation to Russia. I mean, uh, the... the the same set of people usually say about yeah. these things. What, 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 are you, yeah. what are your views? No, this is Russian propaganda. 
NATO no more threatened St. Petersburg than a man in the moon. <laughs> I mean, come on. Like, can we just all, we don't have to, you don't have to tell your kids, but like, can we just all agree here today? Does anybody think Vladimir Putin really feared that NATO was going to roll into Russia? Huh, maybe. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any evidence to support that. Uh, by the way, the United States made a promise to Ukraine in 1994 in the Budapest Memorandum. We said, give up your nuclear weapons, Soviet era weapons, and in exchange for that, if you come under threat, we will support you in your defense. The, the world knows that America made that promise. If we walk away from that, good luck getting Chairman Kim in North Korea to give up his nuclear weapons. Good luck getting any nation to give up anything that matters to them based on an American guarantee. So I would argue there is a deep, uh, a deep important commitment there. Second, to your point, um, this is a European conflict. I, 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 was, a, I was a soldier now uh, decades ago. My first assignment as a young lieutenant was patrolling the then East German border. It was a great job. Drive up and down, M1 tank, put the tank away, go drink beer. Great job. Uh, European kids were sitting at the bar when I got there. Europe has to do the work, just as India needs to do the work in this region. Japan, South Korea, Australia, the list goes on. Um, regional nations need to do the job in the first instance to secure their own sovereignty and their own freedom. That's true in Europe. Uh, but America has a deep interest in Europeans' continued integrity and success as well. Uh, yes, the bigger challenge is from the Chinese Communist Party. The long-term threat, the, the chance that my son, and if we are blessed, our grandchildren, will live in an America that is very different than the one we live in today, comes largely from Xi Jinping and his like in the Chinese Communist Party, not from Russia. That, that much is true. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can allow a sovereign uh, nation to be invaded by an aggressor. We will only encourage folks like Xi Jinping, whether that be in Taiwan or in Los Angeles. And I, I would remind you here, too, uh, it's as true in India as it is in the United States. The Chinese Communist Party isn't just a threat in the Taiwan Straits. They're inside the gates. Uh, the largest spying operation I believe ever conducted on America wasn't by the Russians. It was being conducted out of the Chinese consulate in Houston, Texas, with diplomats operating undercover. And we closed the consulate. We made the decision to close the consulate. Not an easy decision. You can imagine. Oh my gosh, what will the Chinese do? Will they, will they invade Taiwan, will World War III? What they understood was like, these guys, good on you. You figured it out and you crushed it. Uh, they, are, they remain a threat. They're all around us. They're working hard inside our countries. They want to change the nature of India as well. They want it to look more like them than you. And we can't let that happen inside our own countries either. It's complicated. I get it. Deep trade relationships for India deep trade relationships, economic interests for the United States of America as well. I, I know them very, very well. Um, we have to find a model that delivers security and prosperity for ourselves, protects our own trading bloc, and the rules that have delivered India to the place that it is today. And if we do that well, I'm convinced China will end up having to follow suit. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, China in the context of India, particularly because of the change situation in the last three years since uh, the Galwan incident at the border happened uh, in 2020. The, the, uh, there is a perception, there is a school of thought here in India which says uh, the Chinese are poking and testing and the more India is moving in the American orbit or becomes closer to America strategically, uh, then it just incentivizes them to try and do that more, to be more militarily adventurous. Uh, what would you say to that? Um, if, you, if you choose to adopt the model of appeasement, you'll have more Chinese aggression. <laughs> what, what, what does Xi Jinping respect? Does he respect want someone who shows up and pays a tithe, an offering, bends the knee? Or does he respect someone who stands up and says, no, I'm the leader of Latvia. I'm the leader of Bangladesh. I'm the leader of America or India. And I'm going to damn well do the things I need to do to make sure that my people are served well. That's the place with which you can have conversations with Chinese leadership. You can't have relations with the Chinese leadership when you tell the Chinese leadership, no, it turns out we just want to talk more. 
and yeah, we're happy to, we're happy to let you run vessels into the Philippines. We're happy to let you um, make cockamamie statements about the South China Sea. I mean, just ludicrous statements about the South China Sea. They're more ludicrous than thinking that NATO was going to invade Russia. Right? These, these are propaganda campaigns intended to do what the Chinese Communist Party intends. This isn't about military power. Uh, military power matters. You, you must have it. This is a check the block, have to have it. India must have it. We must have it. The West must have it. But this is about, this, this is a larger hegemonic play by the Chinese Communist Party. This is about corrupting trading systems, make sure that the currencies that are used are no longer the traditional currencies, to make sure that uh, energy flows work the way that every international organization is run by the Chinese Communist Party. I, I, you know, I, I, would, I would laugh at my team when they would come in and talk to me about these, uh, these climate change summits. Uh, I'm on debate climate change here today. We've just got a, a few minutes left. But does anybody think for a moment that a Chinese signature on the Paris Climate Accords is worth a damn? Does anybody think, how many coal-fired power plants have the Chinese shut down since they've signed that agreement? Let's all, let's all just deal in reality, not fantasy. This would be my first ask in dealing with China. Observe what they do, not what they tell you in the China Daily Times or the China Global News. Observe what they do. They are, they are the most polluting nation in the world. They have no capacity to generate enough energy for themselves. They are using the Belt and Road Initiative to achieve political influence around the world. And we should acknowledge that they have a, the world's second largest economy, albeit troubled, a huge population, although declining soon. And we should recognize that the Chinese people deserve better. And if we can keep those thoughts in our head, there is a model where we, Europe, South Korea, Japan, Australia, I'm sure I'll leave somebody out, India, uh, Singapore, the United States, Canada, we, 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 can, we can build at a model for the world that gives us another 75 years where we get to live our lives in the way that we so choose. But I just want to take off from what Bodhi was asking you a moment ago. But if you are Xi Jinping and you're in Beijing and you're looking at these two wars, the Russia-Ukraine war and the Israel-Hamas war, in a, in a sense, it also has tested or shown to the world the limits of American power and American mm -hmm. persuasion. Uh, so if you're Xi Jinping and you're looking at these wars and you're saying, you know, America, the most preeminent power in the world, is not able to get the outcomes in this war. It's not able to help Ukraine in a way that Ukraine can win this war. Mm -hmm. It's not able to stop Israel from, uh, you know, causing all these mass civilian yeah. casualties. What then stops Xi Jinping from saying, okay, let me try and see if I can take Taiwan back? Uh, good partners and friends and American leadership. That's what's failed. This, I, I spoke about this already. This is the deterrence that failed. I, I agree. Xi Jinping observes uh, that not just America, don't, don't put this just on America. It's not, it's not fair. It's also dangerous, more importantly, than not being fair. All of us have a responsibility to say, no, we have to go win these things. The world needs to perceive. Everybody loves, right? The Middle Eastern idea is the idea of the strong horse. Everybody follows the strong horse. We, we need to be that. We, collectively, need to be the strong horse. We, we're totally capable of doing this. This is, everybody has angst, like this is hard. This, we, we know precisely how to do this. I think in the four years we were there, we demonstrated that, not perfectly. We could have done more in Hong Kong. I don't know that we could have stopped the, the, the collapse of Hong Kong as we knew it. Um, but we could have done better. We could have done more. I'm, I'm entirely self-critical as well, uh, when appropriate. But yes, no, I think you're right. Uh, if you ask, by the way, what stops Xi Jinping today, it's, I think he figures his generals are lying to him just like Putin's generals lied to him as well. So I'm guessing he's double-checking what everyone's telling him. It's also the case that you know, every, the, 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 the cocktail party talk is about an invasion of Taiwan. Why, why would you invade Taiwan? That's nasty. You blow up TSMC, and so nobody benefits from this. No, the way to take Taiwan is to do what you did in Hong Kong, is to apply pressure and convince the world that, uh, that in fact, Xi, Xi Jinping, that the Chinese Communist Party is the strong horse. You undermine it via all the soft power tools and back it up with a very capable, not only uh, Navy and Army, 
but a powerful nuclear uh, weapons program, a powerful space program. China has each of those. So you have the hard power tools, but your modus vivendi to achieve your objective, which is political control, not just in Taiwan, but in the entire region, Pacific Islands included. Um, I think the model isn't to send a fleet, uh, might do that if he has to, but the model is way more dangerous than that. About India and, and Mr. Modi, there is a view um, among certain institutions, maybe even sections of the Western press, uh, that look, while he's great for the economy and India is the fastest growing large economy and so on and so forth, there is this whole narrative about democratic backslide and freedoms being under threat. Yeah. I'm sure it was there when you were in office as well. What would you say to, the, to, to that narrative having interacted with, with Mr. Modi himself and members of his cabinet uh, in, the, in the four years that you were in office? Uh, you know, it's interesting because that narrative of, what did you describe it as a backslide? Democratic, Democratic backsliding. Democratic. Is the headline in the New York Times today about if President Trump were to be reelected, democracy is at an end. So just, you should know, I have a view on these things. Uh, no, my observation was indeed uniquely different from that. My observation was about an India moving radically forward in all the, all the most central areas. We, um, we don't get it right in the United States every day either on these same set of issues. I was deeply aware of this. Um, what we ask is progress, uh, and you know, we, we put religious freedom at the very top of the list of things we talked about. Uh, we spent a lot less time talking about climate change and a lot more time talking about religious freedom at our embassies around the world. I'm sure that's true for the embassy here today. Uh, you, you'll get it right. Um, I'm confident you all will get it right. You will demand that your democracy be defended and protected. And when your leaders don't, you'll upgrade them. You'll bring them back to the place that you want them to be. Uh, and so I, I didn't observe this. And I, you asked, did I see this when I was there? I, I, didn't, I didn't observe this backsliding of which you speak. I give one other thought about the way we approached the internal policies of other nations, uh, most especially for democracies, uh, less true for authoritarian regimes. But for democracies, we acknowledge that this is tough stuff, that the political fighting that takes place amongst political parties, amongst political actors inside of political parties. I, I was a congressman. I, I'm perfectly, perfectly attuned to that. Um, we should welcome that. This, this is to be encouraged. This exchange of ideas, this political space to express one's view is vitally important. So when I see that take place in India, and I see one, group, one party saying, oh, and another, ah, I think, you know, this is the best of our tradition. Uh, and I certainly experienced that uh, when I observed it from my time in office as well. Uh, I must say, it's one of the things I regret about what happened just uh, last week in the United States, where we had a senior United States senator go to the floor of the Senate and speak about another democracy, Israel, and suggest that the Israeli people needed to change out their leader. Wow. That, the, that, that, that is, uh, Chuck Schumer. Senator Schumer asked for regime change in Israel. That's, that's really quite something uh, to me. It's, it's, uh, it's, in my view, deeply inconsistent with the American tradition about how we respect our fellow democratic peers around the world. We should honor their traditions. They'll choose paths that are different than ours in many cases. But man, the, you, I, I have confidence in the Indian people in ways that apparently Senator Schumer doesn't in the Israeli people. Can I, uh, we almost out of time. Just let me ask you a quick question. Would President Trump concede if he lost this time around? I'm sorry. What? Would President Trump concede if he lost this time around? Oh, sure. He of would? course, yeah, of course. I, I'm still waiting on Secretary Clinton to concede in her election. He, she did, she did, she did the next No, thing. she didn't. She still tweets, go look him up. She still says the thing was fixed. Fair enough. By the way, Al Gore thinks he lost. I still won in 2000. Fair enough. Um, we have rambunctious, very competitive elections in the United States. But we also have a court system and a rule of law that conducted a peaceful transition of power, which caused me to grab my bag and walk out of the door on, noon at June, on January 21st at noon of the year uh, 20th of January 2021. Uh, worry not, whatever CNN International tells you, we will have an election, the election will proceed, and we will have a president duly elected, given, you know, given an inaugural address, 
starting right at noon that day, it will happen. You can write it down. You heard it here first. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, oh, Secretary Michael Pompeo of the United States. Thank you very much for joining us.